Airing on Asheville FM 103.3 LPFM in Asheville, this is the Final Straw Radio, a weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian broadcasts and podcast emanating out of occupied Chalagi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices and perspectives from projects and struggles all around the world, and you can find our archives, transcripts, ways to follow us and support us at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org. This week on the show, you'll hear our conversation with Ray Cthulhu, co-host of the Balkan Amerikanski anti-fascist podcast called The Empire Never Ended. Ray came onto the show to speak about the journal that he co-edits, Antipolitica, anarchist journal from the Balkans, which last year published its third issue, this one on the topic of nationalism. So you'll hear Ray and I talk about the journal, about fascism, nationalism from an anarchist perspective, and surprising to some, nationalism as a project of socialist Yugoslavia. You can find links to the publications and podcasts mentioned in the show notes. I'm speaking with a member of the editorial collective that produces the journal Antipolitica, anarchist journal from the Balkans, uh, which released its third issue last summer. Would you mind sharing your name, any pronouns you want used, uh, any affiliations or other info that you care to flaunt for the audience? Yeah, hi, I'm uh, Ray, uh, he, him. As you said, I'm one of the editors of Antipolitica, the anarchist journal from the Balkans. I'm also, among other things, uh, uh, one of the hosts of the podcast called The Empire Never Ended. Um, Yeah, I think that's enough for now. The English edition of the third issue, and apparently the back issues as well, have become available via PM Press and Chris Plebedeb on this side of the Atlantic. Uh, Congratulations on that. Thanks. Would you mind telling us a bit about the Anti-Politica Collective and the the goals and the scope of the project? Yeah. So uh, Anti-Politica is uh, made by a a network of anarchist friends who all have some connection with the Balkans. They either live there currently or they uh, were born there or they have some other connection to it, basically... If you're our friend, then we'll say that you are a part of our network, if we like you. So also the Balkans is a bit like, um, it's not a very precise term, which is why we like using it. And we decided to make this journal, I think it was in 2015, it was during the the Mediterranean uh, anarchist meeting in Creta. And uh, we were talking about the maybe there is a need to do something like that. And we agreed on to to make a journal which will be thematic, so every issue has a specific theme, and all the texts contained in every issue are a, a part of that, connected to the theme. We publish it very rarely, only three issues, but we do it in... We make separate uh, issues in different languages, so uh, cyber Croatian, uh, English, and Greek. For now, the idea was that we would we wanted to kind of encourage uh, people to write uh, about various important uh, topics from a specifically anarchist um, and anti-statist uh, uh, point of view, not just from a kind of a general leftist one that we are often very critical of, and that point of view is not very developed in most of the Balkans. Of course, the exception exception is Greece. Uh, where the the movement is very developed, as you know. Um, And in the last uh, 15 years, through various projects, such as the Balkan Anarchist Book Fair, we established really good contacts with anarchist comrades from Greece. So another reason uh, for to start this journal was to make our friends uh, from Greece translate their texts into English, because they write a lot, but usually it's only in Greek, so other people can't read it. So that was also a, a, a different uh, reason to start Antipolitica, so that uh, we can also m- make, uh, yeah, so that a lot of points of view from Greece could be read in the rest of the Balkans, but also in the, re- to the, in the rest of the world. So the first issue was, the topic was anti-militarism. This is a very important um, topic for us because the the origins of the, uh, what exists of the anarchist movement in the post-Yugoslav uh, area has its roots in the anti-war movement. 
and there was an uh, we established a connection with also anti-militarist comrades in Greece. So we did that together. Then uh, the second issue was the topic was Yugoslavia, meaning the so-called socialist or Titoist Yug uh, Yugoslavia. Uh, we wanted to provide some radical critiques of that state as a um, class capitalist and also nationalist project because. Uh, you know, since the this, the war that happened in Yugoslavia in the 90s uh, and the complete kind of what we might call a neoliberal attack that happened afterwards, uh, afterwards uh, a lot of people have nostalgic views of Yugoslavia, which is understandable. But we also wanted to point out that many anarchist and anti-state communists uh, in the 60s and 70s developed some critiques of that system as a class and um, capitalist system. So we wanted to remind people of that and s s use that as a kind of starting point to view um, what Yugoslavia was and not, not go below the level of what was already established uh, in the 60s and 70s. And then uh, the newest issue is uh, about nationalism. Uh, and I guess we'll talk more about that. Um, yeah. Yeah. And just a clarification on the network. Well, A, is the network the editorial collective or involved in the editorial collective, or there's just a Venn diagram where there's overlap between? And B, um, there are other existing networking apparatus in the Balkans, such as like anarchist or like f anarchist federations within the Federation of um, Internationals. And, um, I wonder if there's like anything outside of friendship um, that politically, um, ideologically unites the folks that are in the editorial collective. Um, yeah, in a way yeah. that wouldn't just be overlapping with the federation. So we are not a part of any like uh, federation. Uh, no one who I think is a part of our network is. Um, there is a wider network of anarchists in the Balkans, uh, which is the network that uh, organizes the Balkan Anarchist Book Fair. And that's uh, that includes some comrades from Greece and then most of the anarchists that exist uh, in the rest of the Balkans. I think practically all of them. Many of them have opposing views to some issues and um, uh, there are differences there. Uh, but then... Uh, our network that produces Antipolitica is a, a much smaller network of friends who work together and have a closer understanding that was established in the last 15 years. So it is based on uh, friendship and kind of close understanding, but also uh, there are like things that are politically you know, specific about what we do. So... One thing is this uh, that we insist on the anti-militarist approach and also on, on um, criticizing nationalism and completely rejecting um, any kind of idea of a nation, let's say. So unlike some um, comrades or leftists who would maybe use the term anti-imperialism to describe their politics, which usually means that there is some understanding or some um, however critical support for certain nationalist projects that that's not our uh, approach and it it's partially comes from the experience of the wars in the 90s um, but also from the experience of the movement in Greece so I would say that's specific for our view among other things and uh, there is a currently there are three editors uh, this means that we are the people who basically try to coordinate everyone in this network and to think about like when we uh, together at some like when we meet we talk about the possible not only the three editors but everyone uh, in the network occasionally when we meet we talk about the possible topics of issues and then the editors try to connect everyone uh, in the network and think about who could be uh, a good writer for a specific text, uh, ask that comrade if they want to contribute or not, and remind people of the deadlines and such things. The fun stuff, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. so I guess talking about this this uh, current 
latest volume. It's a, I found it to be pretty rich and varied, and it was uh, a lot. There were so many different voices, um, like a number of pre-existing texts that I had read coming from North America on the subject of nationalism. And I wonder if you could talk about a little more about the relationship uh, between anarchists in the Balkans to nationalism and how... I guess not only the, the wars in the 90s following the death of Tito and the the breakup of the Yugoslav of Yugoslavia as a state federation um how it shaped Balkan approaches but also obviously there's also similar issues in Greece and and other parts of the Balkans but particularly I'm wondering about um some of the experiences that have been expressed shared between people that are in this editorial collective of the project well, in our first issue, which is about anti-militarism, there's a very a, a longer text um, uh, written by a comrade uh, from Zagreb uh, who was a part of the anti-war uh, movement uh, in the 90s when the war in Yugoslavia was going on. Um, and that's also a text that explains the origin of the the, the sort of the, the background of what uh, of anti-politica in some way. Although some of us are were too young back then or were not part of the movement at all, uh, the origins of what we do have to do with that, uh, and, that and that and uh, and that's also simul simultaneously the origins of anarchism, the current anarchist movement in general that exists in um, in what used to be Yugoslavia, and that was when uh, anarchists from Croatia and Serbia, the two opposing sides in that war, which also. I mean, the worst part of it was actually happening in Bosnia, uh, established contacts during the war and started doing projects together, anti-war projects, publishing newspapers, um, helping each other in various ways, organizing mutual aid networks, uh, and so on. Um, so uh, for that reason, anti-militarism is very important for us. Um, uh, it, in a very real way, I think it shaped our uh, perspectives and is closely tied to why we are anarchists. Um, but uh, also what I would say, and also why we covered uh, Yugoslavia as a specific topic is, I think also in the way that you posed the question now, mentioning the death of Tito and so on, there is a lot of... Um, there are a lot of uh, kind of uh, fixed conceptions about nationalism and our area and the connection be uh, between the two of them it, not only by uh, people who come outside of the region but also the people inside of it um or you know the, the the views about what is the connection of you know people in yugoslavia and nationalism when nationalism appeared what are the causes of the war what was the role of tito was his death the cause of the war and so on and I would say there's a lot of a lot of misconceptions uh, there, you know. So we might, we are very much against this um, view that nationalism appeared suddenly in the 90s, for example. We would insist that the previous so-called communist system was deeply nationalist, although in a different way from what happened in the 90s. We can talk about that later if you want. We can maybe explain that more. And... But on the other hand, we are also against this kind of maybe thesis present in the liberal, Western liberal mainstream media and so on. The thesis about, or also amongst conservatives probably, about uh, ancient hatreds or something like that, which is pretty nonsensical. There are no such uh, things in the Balkans as ancient hatreds. I mean, all of these so-called hatreds are, you know, t tools of the, let's say, uh, ruling class who propagated these national and chauvinistic ideologies, but they have no origin which is older than the 19th century, which is you know when the concept of nation was established. So they, such a hatred couldn't exist before that, or before the existence of a modern state and mass media and so on. So that's also something that we are critical of, and also with that of this idea that you know, uh, which is also very present and which is very implicitly somehow authoritarian, that only a figure like Tito could uh, keep all of these people together, and when he died, they all, you know, all of these ancient haters just came out and they started killing each other, which really has, is completely nonsensical. And we, we and actually we have a, a, a kind of opposing view 
we think that the 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 communist party of yugoslavia really helped a lot of uh, you know establish these nationalist ideologies and borders between people where it didn't exist before they came uh, to power yeah and just to kind of like na- name that from the from the western gaze as someone coming from someone who grew up in the united states like the balkans appear to have this this unique relationship to nationalism and to chauvinism, whether it be the nationalism that led to the outbreak of World War I with the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand, the genocidal violence during World War II, the multinational project of the, the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, or the wars at the breakup. And it, yeah, I think what you're saying makes sense. Like the, the idea of an ancient hatred kind of presumes that there's something essential within people who live in an area that they would share this uh, essential feature of their identity and be in essential conflict with someone else as opposed to people that live within areas that are conquered and named different things at different times and and more flowing and organic. But yeah, I wonder if you could just talk a little bit more about the concept of like balkanization as it's used now, as you're aware in the West, and the exceptionalist perception that this region in terms of national chauvinism? Well, I mean, that's kind of a... That's too many words, I apologize. No, it's fine, fine. Um, yeah, I think that's like... Um, I mean, the, the whole nationalist model is a, like a model that was established in Western Europe, and then the kind of bourgeois classes in the Balkans copied that model in the early 19th century and established uh, new national ideologies there. Uh, So, I mean, to say there's some specific Balkan connection to nationalism really, you know, misses the whole point that it's a deeply Western European idea in its origin. Um, And that, you know, all of the nationalists that were established in these chauvinistic ideologies in the Balkans had, you know, states like France or or Germany or Italy as the models, and they explicitly stated so, especially in the case of France. So, yeah, that, that doesn't really make a lot of sense historically. On the other hand, you know, the Balkans was a place which, parts of the Balkans at least, had a position in the 19th century that can be compared to, like, colonized areas of the world. Uh, because they were ruled over by empires like Austro-Hungarian or, or also, uh, the Ottoman Empire, and was you know this was the area where these two empires were kind of had a common border, uh, which caused a lot of wars uh, that happened in the 19th century. Uh, so a lot of these nationalist ideologies were established in the context of these wars between empires and local ruling classes trying to establish their own nationalist ideologies in a context of kind of some anti-imperial, uh, even anti-colonial, you could say, struggles and wars. So a lot of nationalism in the Balkans has this kind of connotation to it. And yeah, which is, I mean, maybe we can come back to that question as well. Um, and um, yeah, so the Bal- Balkanization, of course, they would, I mean... We understand that the, what the, the term means. It's an, a negative term. I mean, uh, it makes some sense historically why the term would be used as such. But it's not, you know, the, this process of uh, states separating from other states and uh, having lots of small states in a state of war or some antagonism is not specific only to the Balkans, of course. But okay, that's how the word is used. There were attempts, I think, in the past to kind of reverse the meaning. I think Andrei Grubacic, who's this like a uh, historian also of Balkan origin and anarchist one, he used this term to to give it some kind of revolutionary meaning. Like, and he had had a book called Bal- uh, "Don't Mourn Balkanize," something like this. I am not also don't agree so much with it, that perspective as well. I think it's also kind of getting some essentializing you know a bit kind of exotizing the balkans in some kind of inherently revolutionary area you know which it's not uh, not uh, i would say so yeah i know like a lot of these questions are pointing to really like simple things but i think it's really important 
to hear your perspectives to sort of break apart and um, critique some like assumptions that the listening audience may have because I have because it's on the radio. Also, I don't know who is going to be listening and how much they've been thinking about these issues. And so I kind of want to create a project where people can step in no matter where they're coming from, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, sure. So I remember learning in my teenage years that, like I mentioned, the sparking of World War I is attributed to the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand by Gavril Princip, who I had heard variously was an anarchist, but also I'd heard was a Bosnian nationalist. One of the essays in the latest Antipolitica called Jungslauen and Nihilist Nationalism in 1907 to 1914, I apologize for pronunciation, offers some interesting insights into the dynamics of nationalism, socialism, and anti-imperialism in that part of the Habsburg Empire as it existed at the time. Could you talk a little bit about ideological and practical overlaps between anarchists and nationalists or even government officials in that period of the breakup of of empire? Sure, yeah. So Gavrilo Princip was usually, it is said that he was one, uh, a member of a nationalist revolutionary group, group called Young Bosnia, which at that point really wasn't a group. It was like a more, you could call it a, a milieu or kind of a subculture almost of usually high school kids from different cities in Bosnia who had this um, nationalist, anti-imperialist, anti-colonial perspective and want, basically set as their goal the destruction of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. He's sometimes still portrayed as an anarchist, which he wasn't. He was not a, a Bosnian nationalist. Uh, he was, we might say, a Yugoslav nationalist. Although the group was called Young Bosnia, it, at the time, something like a Bosnian nationalism didn't really exist, was not completely formed as an ideology. But there was uh, 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 this ideology of Yugoslav nationalism, the idea that the South Slavs in the Balkans are one nation or should become one nation, and should form their own nation state. Uh, this was not completely contrary to, or it was not um, contradictory completely to Serbian nationalism or Croatian nationalism. Lots of these people uh, amongst these uh, Bosnians were at the same time Serbian nationalist and Yugoslav nationalist, or Croatian nationalist and Yugoslav nationalist. Um, they saw. Uh, Serbia was at that uh, point um, an in, in so-called independent nation-state already and was sometimes seen by these nationalists as um, com- uh, comparable to what the uh, Italian state of Piemont used, was in the 19th century, the state that united the whole of Italy into one nation-state. That's some- how some of them saw Serbia as a, kind of the, the Yugo- Yugoslav state uh, which will be the leading force that will dis- dis- help destroy the Austro-Hungarian Empire and unite the whole of Yugoslavia. Uh, so, um, a lot of uh, these kids, or very young people in young Bosnia, came. They were very poor. They came uh, in Bosnia at the time. There was still basically a, some kind of a feudal remnants of a feudal system. It was a, a region that was ruled by the Ottoman Empire for a very really lo- long time. There were like landowning classes and there were serfs. A lot of these people came from the serf class. Uh, but also, it, since the 1878, although officially Bosnia was still part of the Ottoman Empire, it was in uh, de facto uh, ruled by Austro-Hungary. It was a kind of a weird system where they were, they were ruling it de facto, although not uh, still officially saying that it's part of Turkey. So this is why there was this focus on fighting the Austro-Hungarian Empire, because it was ruled basically as a colony. There was like a, a governor there appointed from Vienna, and um, the whole system existed of that kind. Members of Young Bosnia were very poor, very dedicated nationalist revolutionaries, who, because of this, are you know often um, idealized in some way, uh, because of their you know objective kind of heroism, the will to uh, for you know self sacrifice and so on. Um, but the truth is that their ideology was very nationalist, and uh, we don't 
you know, criticize this in some kind of a moralistic way. We just say that uh, if your goal is some kind of um, liberation of, you know, humanity on individual and collective uh, levels, nationalist ideology isn't objectively a big obstacle to it, uh, regardless of what motivations of individual nationalist or nationalist groups are, or how, you know, you can justify it on some emotional, psychological level which, you know, we understand. And the thing is that, uh, so there is a connection with anarchism, and that's because, you know, anarchism, the anarchist movement really was the, the revolutionary movement of the 19th century. It, everyone who uh, was, you know, wanted to be a revolutionary of any kind, uh, even, you know, a more kind of bourgeois nationalist uh, revolutionary, had to be inspired to, to some degree uh, by anarchists. Uh, you couldn't be inspired by Marxists at the time. They were like, you know, like uh, the leaders of the German Social Democratic Party were not inspiring for revolutionaries. Um, anarchists were. Um, and for this reason, also people like Gavrilo Princip were very much inspired by them. They, all the, they were also very, they, th these people read a lot. They read a lot and they read all the time. Um, and a lot of the literature they read were, you know, books by Kropotkin, Johann Most, uh, Bakunin, Stepniak, and so on. And they were serious about reading. They had, like, book clubs. They uh, discussed these ideas. They were also, they read um, anarchist newspapers published out of Vienna and so on. But they also explicitly said that they, although they had sympathies towards some anarchist points and thought that, these are maybe realistic solutions, but for some faraway future, uh, what we need now is a nationalist revolution. We want to establish a nation state for the Yugoslavs. And even though they had socialist and republical like inclinations, they even said, okay, even if it's a monarchy, we would support that because the most important thing is to establish this nation state and to destroy Austro-Hungary. So for that reason, we cannot call them anarchists of any kinds All although they were influenced by them, which is you know, understandable. And they explicitly said they were not anarchists. Uh, so it's kind of you know, curious why some anarchists today even refer to them as such. And, um, and then the, you know, the problems with that kind of ideologies are very clear if we look at what their tra trajectory was. A, a, lot of, a lot of them were killed like they were, because they successfully, no one actually believed they will be able to do it, but they killed Franz Ferdinand, the Austro-Hungarian prince, you know, which set off this you know, chain of events that led to the First World War. And actually, you know what, they kind of planned, uh, I, I don't think it's what, you know, it was not their doing, but it actually happened. You know, uh, this, uh, the events happened that led to the destruction of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and to the establishment of the Yugoslav nation. Yeah, I think it's also worth noting, and, and I don't know how much of it is like poor perspectives on like current day anarchists who like maybe people just want to be like, well, look, look what we did, like another regicide, one of many great ones that we conducted. Um, but I could see... I could see some very surface level um, overlaps between um, things that are in the world of, of anarchism and things that are in the world of nationalism around like a, a focus in some circles on direct action and um, like a valorization of, of martyrdom, uh, a focus on the devolution of power from larger structures down to smaller structures, and also especially in some individualist tendencies within anarchism, uh, like a, a focus on elitism, right? Um, so I didn't know if maybe these things were, I mean, th maybe those are some of the things that the young Bosnians or whatever other group were sort of like focusing on, like, I really like this Nietzsche guy. Oh, that Stirner person said a few interesting things. Or if it's just a, a misunderstanding in the way, yeah, I don't know. Does that spark anything? Yeah, I think you're right. They were influenced by a lot of things that you mentioned I would say that that was like a superficial influence of anarchism that was, you know, caused by uh, anarchism being such an important revolutionary movement at the time. So very much they were focused on things like direct action. They used the term direct action. They were fascinated by all of the assassinations that the uh, anarchists were doing at the time of, you know, heads of state and so on. But they were superficially see those things as anarchists. You know, they would say, anarchist methods, for example. We apply anarchist methods, and by that they 
thought of assassination as there if no there's nothing inherently anarchist about uh, assassinating someone or they would use the term such as general strike uh, th this is the generation uh, that brought uh, that term into serbo croatian language were these people N not all of them were in bosnia there was lots of groups like this in croatia as well who were connected to the ones in bosnia uh, so in, in croatia especially amongst the student youth the the idea of a general strike was very popular which came from an anarchist influence or you know revolutionary syndicalist or anarcho syndicalist influence but they again gave a national meaning or a nationalist meaning to it they didn't see a general strike as a way to realize social revolution but a nationalist one and they explicitly stated so they, they so they consciously used some superficial aspects of anarchism or libertarian socialism or revolutionary syndicalism but gave it an um, a nationalist meaning and this was not all this was not the invention of the people in the balkans this was already going on in france in italy by you know followers of people like sorel and so on and these were actually the, these people who influenced people such as young bosnia and the groups student groups that i mentioned in croatia were the french uh, uh, people and Italian people who really invented fascism, like they were the proto-fascists, the, who tried to synthesize aspects of so you know, allegedly revolutionary socialist ideas with extreme nationalism. So there is a certain also kind of proto-fascist quality to some of these groups as well. Yeah, I really I appreciate that answer. And thanks for letting me like pop that in there, because I think that there's to some listeners, maybe we were kind of getting in the weeds with that question a little bit. But I think that there's a lot mm -hmm. of, um, like I said, that issue three, which is the one that I've read all the way through, goes deep into these topics of nationalism from anarchist perspectives um, in very particular cases, because I think that from doing that, you can draw out some more generalizable conditions um, and compare them between different situations it helps helps to broaden the conversation and deepen the conversation on what is nationalism what are the horizons that it offers and how do anarchists fall into the trap of thinking within those horizons yeah uh, i also wanted to point out one other thing which i think will illustrate how this what we are talking about is a like a real practical problem and not like a moralistic one is that uh, a lot of these people, although, you know, they had these kind of admirable, heroic, self-sacrificing qu qualities to them, and, you know, goals such as destroying an empire, which is, you know, good. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, because they were nationalists, they didn't have a problem uh, with supporting, for example, Serbian chauvinistic views of Albanians or Serbian kind of imperialist ambitions in the rest of the Balkans. So they didn't have a problem in joining like um, Serbian state sponsored guerrillas, uh, the Chetniks, even be before the First World War, who were waging guerrilla warfare in what were still parts of the Ottoman Empire in the Balkans, often, you know, committing atrocities against the Albanian population and so on. Um, and even later on, uh, some of these people uh, who survived the First World War uh, became important figures in the Yugoslav kingdom and occupied some um, academic positions or political ones and so on. And, and one of them became um, uh, an important historian, Vaso Čubrilović, who was also like one of the one of the assassinate, uh, like assassins of Sarajevo, who was very young, uh, he was a minor, so he was not sentenced to death. He survived the war and became an important academic and also kind of advisor to politicians in, in both the monarchist Yugoslavia and later on the Titoist one, where he actually became a government minister after the Second World War. He, he became a kind of an expert, expert for ethnic cleansing. I think he came up with the term. And um, a, a lot of thought behind it had to do with this nationalist ideology that we talked about. So they would using, you know, influenced by the 19th century nationalist ideas and also with these this early kind of proto-fascist ideas that we talked about, they use terminology such as non-national elements, for example. So uh, unlike many contemporary nationalists, these people actually had, a, I think, a correct view that a nation is something that you create. You know, it's not 
an unnatural phenomenon. You have to create it. And they wanted to create a Yugoslav nation. And then they said, okay, we there is like national and then there are non-national and anti-national elements. People who are not nationalist or are or a wrong ethnicity or it could be whatever. And then you need to cut them off in some way. And uh, that would could mean that you need to, you know, educate people in a more nationalist way. You need to create nationalist propaganda, nationalist literature, art, and so on. It could also mean genocide in some cases, uh, or necessarily would also include ethnic cleansing. And for the, uh, in their view, Albanians were such an anti-national or non-national element in the Yugoslav land, lands that needed to be ethnically cleansed. And he, this guy that I mentioned, he wrote a, a scientific paper on how to ethnically cleanse Albanians from Yugoslavia, offered various solutions and offered it to the government to implement it. Not only to the monarchist one, also to the, the Titoist one later on. And... And at the same time, he was always very proud of his young Bosnian origin and really didn't, there was no contradiction between the two things. This is this is maybe a little bit into the weeds, but like you were talking about how a lot of the tendency, like this, these nationalist movements were reproducing or growing from ideas that had developed in Western Europe during the 19th century and nationalism is a product of modernity. And like an important influence in the development of fascism was the romantic movement and the rejection of certain elements of modernism without rejecting certain methods of modernism. So that's, I think, like when I read about history from that period of time, or even people right now that are writing with these sort of conceptions of, uh, again, I'll use the term essentialism, like who belongs in an area or what a nation is composed of, comprised of, and what its nature is. They're saying, well, these these structures like work in order to to build barriers to include and exclude, and then like linguistically, culturally, whatever. But we have to pull back to something that is er that predates and lies underneath um, this modern creation that you know this sort of like prehistorical yeah anyway yeah you know what i'm getting at yeah. words fail me yeah. but um but i wonder if you could talk about like how like this romantic turn is like not just a rejection of modernism it's not just a non-modernism it's a rejection of modernism and how that shapes the creation of these like ethno states well, I think that you know. Okay, so I think that na nationalism is a deeply, as you said, a, a modern project. I could, I think, it couldn't exist in a kind of a pre-modern uh, period because it requires the existence of a nation state and, uh, or, or not only a nation state, a modern state with all of its institutions that didn't exist really pre nineteenth century. Which I think, um, I think the modern state has a like a specific kind of totalitarian character. It. To it like in the previous politics that existed systems there was much more autonomy uh, we're, by that we're not saying that it was anarchy or something like that but there was less of this total control by all-encompassing institutions you know which is the characteristic of the modern state and then with it you have this integrating ideology which is the idea of a nation and of course this is all happening in the context of capitalism which is, you know, destroying, completely annihilating actual real communities, cultures, and so on. But, I, okay, this is maybe my kind of, um, uh, maybe too simplified explanation, but I would say, you know, I think that people have, I believe, some kind of inherent tendency to l live in collectives. They need some kind of a, a culture to belong to, uh, not in a modern, like, nationalist sense. I mean, just kind of a... We're social animals. Yes, like a community, really, is the word uh, that I'm looking for. They need a community. And when you destroy actual communities, there is still a need, like an authentic need for a community. And then I think what the modern state gives to that authentic need is a kind of a false answer of this imagined community, which is the nation. So the, the need for belonging to a community is, I think, authentic, but then this is a kind of a surrogate false answer to that authentic need, is the nation. And in that sense, it's very modern, because you need an, a kind of alien, alienated population, a atomized one by capitalism, that has a longing to, to belong 
uh, to an attending community but cannot have such a thing. And then you give them this nationalist chauvinistic ideology instead, which actually supports the interests of the ones who are in the ruling posi position. Also, this, I mean, so fascism is a kind of a, a more extreme version of 19th century nationalism, um, but it's also a very, I think it's a bit, um, they are both, both this anti-modern, but also super modern aspects to fascist ideology, uh, as you mentioned. But I, I think that, you know, fa I, I look at fascism as not necessarily a political movement or a movement. It has some as like some qualities of such a thing but i think essentially it's um you know it's a it's a this kind of a, a reaction of capitalism or you know the bourgeoisie uh in extreme situations when the the rule of capital is maybe endangered to a certain extent because of the cyclical uh, crisis of capitalism that it always goes through or the a strong anarchist, socialist, communist movement that exists. So you have this kind of reaction uh, in the form of fascism. And I think we can also look at fascism, you know, partially maybe it's something that has the qualities of a political movement, but also something that is maybe even more related to the police, you know, the institution of the, uh, the, the police. Like, it, it is not, I think, by accident that often, you know, there is overlap between cops and the membership of fascist organizations or, or groups like the KKK in the US and so on, or the Golden Dawn in Greece, uh, because there's a they serve a similar function in capitalist societies. They are there to terrorize people, to, you know, protect the privileged classes, to direct anger, resentment in ways that benefit uh, the ruling class uh, and so on. But more importantly, you know, to terrorize people. They're, so the ideology there is almost a kind of an afterthought. It's not so important. So we can, you know, get into analyzing all of the contradictions of, it, of the ideology, but uh, the contradictions are there because it's not really important. Like, are they uh, uh, against or for modernity? They are for, you know, bashing people is what they are. And then, you know, they also like nice uniforms and so on uh, to think of themselves as heroes. But, the you know, I think that a lot of these kind of um, alt-right, new right types, the so-called intellectual or arty um, uh, fascists are not important because we on our podcast we read their stupid books you know they present themselves as kind of important thinkers and so on usually we find out that it's very banal things that they write about they are there more to give some kind of um, image of respectability to some of these ideas that a lot of liberals uh, somehow um are they are very gullible and they kind of believe you know they uh, a lot of liberals have this tendency to accept uh, like people with who are educated or have good manners and who are not don't look like street thugs as people that you want to uh, have a conversation with and so on. So I think this is the function of the of people like that. Uh, these fascist ideologues who are you know uh, discussing things like modernity and so on. It's again, it's not really about ideas. It's about uh, giving some respectability to people and some cover to people who are doing what is really important and that's you know violence or terrorizing terrorizing people psychologically and so on and destroying social movements and uh, and yeah so it you know so this is why we have like super modern tendencies in like early italian fascism who you know were into like avant-garde movements such as fut futurism who wanted to s destroy roman like uh, statues and buildings and had such plans and then you have this very romantic anti-urban ideology amongst the german nazis who wanted to abandon cities and so on of course they didn't abandon cities when they came into power uh but you know uh, a part of their mobilization had ideology like this but i don't think it's really the most important thing when it comes to fascism the Final Straw is a proud member of the Channel Zero Network of Anarchist Podcasts, and here's a jingle from another member of CZN. People need ordering principles. Twelve Rules for What is a podcast about fascism and the far right from the perspective of the... the 2024 shut them down series of protests and strikes around the so-called U.S., 
Or you can find our chat with the editors of the recent three-way fight book published by PM Press and Kersplebedeb for a little bit more of that anti-fascist action. We'd also love to see an infusion of cash to be able to do some much-needed promotion for the show. We're pretty well shadow banned on a lot of platforms, um, and so other methods of getting word out about the show and getting more listeners would be wonderful. Uh, One of the things we'd like to do is replenish our stickers for distribution by radical publishers with their book orders, uh, or even like shooting for the moon it'd be lovely to be able to pay an artist for a new t-shirt design if you don't want to do the patreon thing but you do have money that you wouldn't mind contributing to us uh, we also have links for ways that you can purchase merch or make donations at tfsr.wtf slash support so in the uh, the article in the Dungeon of Nationalism, the Communist Party of Yugoslavia and the National Question, which is also in this third volume of Antipolitica, it really dives into the project of the construction and the reconstruction of nationalism by the Leninist government that arose out of the communist and anti-fascist formations during World War II. The approach that is described in this piece reminds me of the programmatic Marxist-Leninist approach of overcoming capitalism by way of constructing a bourgeois revolution, but for the national hang-ups. So as in, like, like, there are steps to get to a place we need to walk through each step in order to get there, otherwise our development will be incomplete. Is that a fair comparison? And can you talk a bit about some of the misconceptions of the former uh, former Yugos- like so-called socialist Yugoslavia of the relationship between the SFRY and the national question? What does the Yugo nostalgia miss? What are they leaving out? Yeah. Well, okay. So, so the, this Yugoslavia that was established after the Second World War and was, as you said, based really on um, what uh, it was based on the, the role that the partisan movement had during the Second World War, which was the anti-fascist resistance movement, the Yugoslav one, um, led by the Communist Party of Yugoslavia, which was one of the biggest, I think, with the Polish resistance movements. It was the largest resistance movement during the Second World War in, in Europe. Well, the thing is that, you know, the Communist Party of Yugoslavia was a Stalinist party. Often it is said Marxist, Leninist, which is the way Stalinists call themselves. We really, I think we can call them Stalinists. So, you know, I think this was a deeply nationalist ideology. And exactly as you said, there is this parallel of how they viewed uh, capitalism to how they viewed nation states and the need to establish nations or to have bourgeois revolutions, as you mentioned. So if we look at uh, earlier history, you know, when orthodox Marxism was established in the end of the 19th century, it was based on the worst aspects of Marxist theory, I would say. And one of these aspects was this kind of progressivist view of history, evolutionary view of history, a linear view of human history. There are phases in it, and they are progressive, and one leads to another, and so on. So it's a view that capitalism is... A progressive, it's a better than feudalism, feudalism better what existed uh, before. And it's necessary to go for humanity to go through these phases because this is how you will eventually reach socialism or communism or anarchy, a stateless, classless uh, society without nations and so on. And so it's a kind of a paradoxical view that, you know, in order to support reaching a, a society without state or class or nation, you need to support state statist and classist and nationalist societies because that's the way you get there uh you cannot skip it somehow was the idea and that that's what they call a kind of a scientific view to be against that like many not only anarchists but like the most uh, socialists of the 19th century in the balkans as well didn't think in that such a way they were thinking okay if we want to have a communist society then we shouldn't support capitalism. We should, um, for example, they had an idea in the Balkans. Some of them, there were like remnants of old institutions still alive in the Balkans, like the way they organized in cooperatively, uh, you know, already, like um, like in Russia, what was called, you know, the Obstina, or similar things existed in in the Balkans as well. So some of these socialists of the 19th century thought, okay, we can use these institutions that somehow exist already, people being self-organized to produce together, live communistically and so on, as a basis to create some kind of a communist socialist 
anarchist, whatever you want to call it, society of the future. And we shouldn't do it. In, we shouldn't approach these institutions in some like a static way as as they are, because they have a very you know patriarchal character to them and so on. We should change them, but we can use them to create something better and not destroy them in order to create uh, you know. Uh, a proletariat, a miserable class that will work in factories because that's the way to create communism. But Orthodox Marxists is, is exactly what they thought. So, for example, in Serbia, in the beginning of the 20th century, uh, a Mar or like an Orthodox Marxist party was formed, or actually the leadership of it what was Orthodox Marxists, which is the Social Democratic Party of, of Serbia which was later in 1919 one of the groups that founded the Communist Party of Yugoslavia. Uh, but even before the First World War, they had this kind of ideology. So at the same time, uh, you know, in like, I don't know, 1907, for example, in, in, in Serbia, in Belgrade, you had anarchist group and revolutionary syndicalist groups who were workers and who were very radical, who were often on strike, occupying factories, having demands and so on. Uh, and then you had the leadership of the Social Democratic Party, which didn't like that the workers were striking so much. And you have, you know, their correspondence where you can see that these these Marxist leaders are saying, well, all, all these workers are crazy. All, all they want to do is be on strike. And if this uh, happens, then we'll never reach socialism because Serbia is still a backwards, primarily agrarian country. We need foreign in investment to develop industrial capitalism. And if the workers are non-disciplined and not striking all the time, this won't happen. No one will invest and we can have uh, communism. So in the same way, they approach, because it goes together with it, this idea of nation and nationalism. Because the characteristic of a modern state, which is what you want to have, is that it's a nation state. And pop, uh, every population, every ethnicity, whatever that means, needs to become a nation. If it's not, then it's backwards. So what... Uh, so in the 19th century, there was this idea of a Balkan federation, but the 19th century fed the, uh, socialists gave it a more kind of libertarian, more anarchistic, although not all of them were anarchist, meaning. So they, they, what they meant by it, we want a federation of communes. They were inspired by a Paris commune and so on, not of nation states. But social democrats and then communists, Stalinists, uh, gave it the meaning of a federation of nation states. So originally what they wanted was to, to for this uh, federation to encompass also Bulgaria, Albania, Romania, and, and so on, ideally also Greece. But this was not possible after the Second World War because uh, Greece was controlled still by um, the Western powers, although there was a civil war in, inside of it. And there was a split between the Communist Party of Yugoslavia and the uh, Soviet Communist Party or Stalin and Albania and Bulgaria went to the other side supporting Stalin and then you had Yugoslavia left and so what they decided to do then is to form new Titoist Yugoslavia as a kind of a smaller version of a Balkan Federation they were always against this older monarchist idea of a single Yugoslav nation, which is the idea that also people like young Bosnia had, who wanted to form one Yugoslav nation. The Stalinists were not for this. They thought that that kind of idea is an extension of like greater Serbian chauvinism and imperialism. What they wanted to do is to f uh, help further establish separate nations such as Serbia and Croatia, uh, Slovenia, and then form national movements to establish uh, nations where they didn't exist before, like Montenegro, uh, Macedonia, and also in time, a kind of a Bosniak nation, a nation that would consist out of people of, who are Muslims from Bosnia, who would be eventually established as a separate nation, although at first they, they didn't uh, call them that. They considered them um, a nationality, which the, the Titoists considered a different thing than a nation. It was like a lower phase in their worldview. So for this reason, the Titoist Yugoslavia was established as a federation of nation states. So every republic was defined as a nation state. And every uh, republic, it was designed as a, a nation state for a specific ethnicity or group. And some of them had more than one. So Serbia was a nation state of S S the Serbian nation. But Croatia was, as, for example, defined as a nation state of Croats and also of Serbs who live in Croatia. Bosnia was defined as a nation state of ethnic Serbs 
ethnic Croats in Bosnia and also of Bosniaks, uh, who were this, this Muslim uh, population there, and so on. Other republics was established in such a way as well. This also meant in this kind of system, which was sometimes you, know, you can call it state capitalist, whatever, but for sure it was a capital. It wasn't a liberal capitalist system, but a capitalist system where you have workers and bosses and a market and so on. Uh, it also meant that they established new ruling classes in each of the republics. And these were not classical bourgeois classes because this was not liberal uh, capitalism, but they were like bureaucratic ruling classes, uh, which were organized in national so-called communist parties. So there was a communist party of Croatia, communist party of Serbia, communist party of Montenegro, and so on. And these were, you know, ruling classes that had a, a nationalist character to them. They were ruling over a republic which was defined as a nation state. So, you know, what gave them position, this position of power was a nationalist structure. One that said, we have many, you know, seven different nations in Yugoslavia. So this is why we say that this was a, a completely nationalist state. It was all, everything was about nationalism. And, you know, what happened in the 90s was the historical, you know, situation changed. And then a war happened because of specific reasons. But it's not like nationalism appeared in the 90s. It was there the whole time. And it was imposed by the, this ideology, basically a Stalinist ideology of the Communist Party. So, I mean, the way that you're describing it, if, if the makeup of this nation here is defined by the various people with different religious and maybe linguistic tendencies and cultural histories, what have you, in one area, if in Croatia it's Serbs and Croats, and it's not defined by a Croatian like ethnic identity, as you said, whatever that means, how does that differ outside of naming from just like the creation of geographically uh, defined states within, you know, within a federal republic. How does that, where does the, where does that lay the seeds for nationalism, like as in ethno-nationalism, right? People are identified, if they're identified mostly by where they're living and who their neighbors are, but not necessarily by what differentiates them as essential characteristics from their neighbors, um, can you go, do you understand what I'm asking? I think so. But I mean, this is not, I don't think that this makes a lot of sense, anything they want they did. So it's difficult for me to answer that because I think it's to a great degree nonsensical. But they had this idea that, you know, nations will be formed uh, and nations are reflected in nation states. So I don't know, like, in, um, I guess they had an idea that, you know, they will overcome this kind of ethnic nationalism into something like civil nationalism. So the Croatian civil nation will also encompass Ser uh, people of Serbian ethnicity who live there, I think was the idea. And also for the other republics, something like this, I think they had in mind. But, I mean, there are problems with this, of course, because... Um, you create this kind of situation, which is, you know, so a lot of people were not, you know, often people like ordinary non-political people who come from Yugoslavia also have this view that nationalism appeared in the 90s. But that's because, which is true, people were not, nationalism in a sense that people were not obsessed with chauvinistic ideas. They lived their daily lives. Some of them were not, younger people were not, for example, in Croatia, were not aware if they come from a Serb or ethnically Croat family. Uh, they had to ask their parents in the 90s, are we Serbs or Croats? That's true. But that doesn't mean that nationalism didn't exist there as a, as a structure, you know, that then made you know what you are at a certain point. You know, are you this or that? In that sense, it always existed. All the ordinary people in their daily lives were not obsessed with these questions. But they were ruling classes who ruled the, over these national structures, and it was very important them, for them for it to exist in such a way because this was their source of legitimacy and power in the structure that they had. And in the 90s, that meant war. So you had to choose a side or, you know, or become a deserter or something like this. So, so I don't know. Like, I'm not, I don't know if this is an answer to your question. I don't think it makes a lot of sense really. But um, it's also, you know, they had this, uh, they were also saying that they are against nationalism at the same time, uh, which is pretty insane, uh, considering that they were doing all of this. But um, I think the idea was that, like, um, they also believed in, said that they believe in some future where there will be no nations, but you cannot just not have a nation. You know, you, you first you have to have a nation, and then in time, humanity will reach 
uh, the level of like not having nations, which is like completely, you know, so one, one thing that we, are, for example, talked about in our podcast is our, my, like our, my co-host Boris talked a little bit about the history of political organizing of the like Yugoslavs in the United States in the 1930s. So there was a lot of socialist and communist uh, among them. And they have a tendency to, to have these, you know, kind of socialist clubs where immigrants would hang out. And it was really not important for them if they were coming from Serbian or Croat or Bosnian or Slovenian families and so on. They were hanging out together and doing their own things in their socialist clubs and so on. And then the Communist Party made them at some point uh, dissolve these organizations that had this kind of old Yugoslav character and to organize in separate Serbian, Slovenian, Croat and so on groups. Um, and there was almost a kind of a rebellion amongst these workers who like couldn't understand why are you making us, you know, not hang out with our friends because and aren't we supposed to be against nationalism? Like, and of course they made them do it because that's, you know, the kind of the progressive uh, way to do it in their pretty I don't know nonsensical ideology in, in uh, uh, so yes it's it's very paradoxical I don't think it makes a lot of sense yeah and the story of that being then reimposed when the Stalinists yeah. come back in and especially the yeah. point that Boris made about like yeah and when the newspapers are already in the same language why are we producing three newspapers when all of us yes. are in the same workers like organizations yeah. anyway I mean yeah I could see it maybe be I mean but since it was imposed from outside it's it's obviously ideological I could see there being some sort of um, like well, in in reaction to American like Anglo chauvinism, maybe mm -hmm. you you combine in certain ways or combine in different ways depending on. But it should be defined by the people that are actually doing the struggling and organizing and living there. Sure, yes. Yeah, um, but your point about like the step of civic nationalism and the creation of that is well taken, and I think that answers kind of my question of because that that mm -hmm. is like a modernist model of experience within a nation state. Um, as, yeah, yeah. Although I think you know the the line separating civic and ethnic nationalism is not very clear, and it often you know one becomes the other, mutates, and so on. Yeah, agreed. But but then we find the difference between like the ideological, like what what were the germs of like the French Revolution and the role of people in the French Revolution? What are we trying to reproduce here because we think it's a necessary step towards towards the anarchistic communist world i guess that we're building we're building the workers for mm -hmm. because this is even if you're literally publishing things that were said from within the yugoslav socialist federation or you know uh, the sfry like these are things these are actual statements these are proposals and and carried out um directives from within the party at the time um but a lot of a lot of um, the nostalgia that's going on right now, as you said, washes over the role of nationalism within that period of time. I wonder like, what kind of left reactions from either within the Balkans or former Yugoslavia or from, from the internet or whatever you've gotten to the articles that you've published. Um, they do get a lot of pushback where like people are like, that's not what... That's not what happened, or... Well, I think uh, at first, like, Antipolitica got a worse reaction from a lot of leftists than pushback, which was, like, just ignoring us. Pushback would be nice. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, lately, there is less of that. Now they're not ignoring us so much. Um, there were some debates a little bit here and there. Um, but I think it's, this kind of point of view is getting noticed more. I think that the thing is, you know, in a lot of areas of like the what Yugoslavia used to be, there there are anti-nationalists, but they usually come from a kind of a liberal perspective. And then, unfortunately, a lot of leftists actually have nationalist views. So you often have like leftist nationalists and liberal anti-nationalists. So we are trying to somehow create a perspective that would be, you know, a radical anarchist, uh, definitely not liberal, anti-nationalist perspective. And it's a bit difficult, you know, to communicate with people, even to have arguments if such a perspective doesn't really exist. You know, uh, it's not only about the points that we make, it's also about 
using the language in a different way, meaning different things when you say state, nation, and so on. So for this reason, I think it, it takes some time um, in order to create um, the, uh, the readership uh, in a way or, or to cultivate it that we will be able to have a conversation with. Although there is a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of interest, like a lot of copies are definitely distributed across the Balkans and much more than we thought we will have to reprint uh, all of the issues. Uh, so it is being read. Yeah, with the the way that you're talking about the anti-nationalist um, liberal perspective, I, I, I have appreciated the more like anti-nationalist perspectives coming from the left, whether they be anarchist or anti-state communist uh, around this, like I was remembered the, like the rise and rule of the extreme center as one of the additions within yeah. this, this edition. I think that like the critique of, of rad libs of um, extreme mm -hmm. centrism, whether it be from specifically ways that international institutions military and policing structures or think tanks get directed towards um, like anti-extremism studies, including the yeah. directed against anti-fascists, um, for instance, or, or yeah, the visions, the visions of a future beyond national borders where it means the expansion of NATO or some other like international militarist mm -hmm. organization is mm -hmm. like it, that has to be spoken about because it's, yeah, it's so hegemonic at this point in, in the dialogue of the powerful, the mainstream media or whatever, especially in the West that, yeah, it's good to think about. Yeah, for sure. Could you talk a bit about the art that's in there? Because I, I think it's a beautifully late, like the, the cover is, <laughs> is really provocative, but the, the art that you use, the, the photo montage, um, I already expressed to you off mic that I'm really disturbed by some of the, <laughs> some of the visuals of Americana paintings that you use, but, yeah, maybe a little bit about the. It it feels like a lot of, a lot of the imagery is from so many different eras and artistic movements that it feels like really in juxtaposition to the texts. But at sometimes it also seems to really uh, really pop out and say a lot as commentary. Yeah, I mean, I'm of all of the of the three editors and a lot of people who collaborate on anti politica. I'm probably the least. Um, uh, like qualified or whatever you want to call it, uh, person to talk about this because I don't know much about it. What I, as you know, could say is that I wanted it to look nice, mm -hmm. um, and I think it looks nice. Uh, but um, like for example, the the two other editors, they they know both of them. They they know a lot of about like art history and so on. A lot of our comrades from Greece are also. Uh, very knowledgeable in that area. There's a lot of influence in what we do coming from the avant-garde movements and specifically like this, uh, the situationist. Uh, also, I mean, you know, there is an awareness of art, but also the will to overcome it as a kind of alienated, similar like we talk to politics and why it's called anti-politica, uh, to uh, uh, overcome these um, alienated areas of life that are dealt by you know specialists and somehow integrate them in the, the the wholeness of our daily life as we want to have it so uh yeah i think i i'm the i i wasn't actually so much um involved in that part uh to some extent collecting some photographs illustrations but usually you know the layout is done by other people and um uh, also these two editors really chose also the uh, one of them chose those illustrations that disturbed you. Uh, that was uh, their idea. Uh, I think it's a very good one. So yeah, it's it, you know the the it, that whole process is done in a similar way. Like I described w the way we do it with the articles. It's a co kind of a collaborative uh, way to do it with some coordination uh, between us. Yeah, since you didn't really say much about, um, or I didn't ask about the anti-politica, like, what does anti-politics mean? Yeah, we have this short text that we print in every issue. The point is somehow to say that, you know, politics is, you know, we are told a kind of a specific area of life that is usually de dealt by some kind of specialists. The point is to say that we want to see life as a... Um, 
one uh, whole thing that has uh, you know different qualities to it but that you cannot separate something like politics from the rest of it i guess is the point and also um, to make a point that this was specifically also an anarchist view of life and what we call politics from the start for example marxist often you know in the 19th century said to anarchists that they don't have a political program or something like that um, because they didn't, um, they didn't accept this idea of politics as uh, you know something done by politicians, political parties, parliaments, and so on. Uh, that in a way you can say that everything is political or that nothing is political at the same time. So this is maybe what we mean by anti-political or anti-politics. Well, just to to cap off the part of the conversation about anti politica, how can folks engage with the editorial collective, and is there a, a next volume already in the offing or in, in planning at least? Yeah, so we have a blog. It's antipolitica.noblogs.org. The PDFs of first and second issue are available there. Soon there will be a PDF of the third issue there as well. There is a contact there. If anyone wants to, they can send us an email. Oh, we'll see that immediately. We are thinking about the next issues and are only working on them, not only one, but a few. You're trying to do things faster by doing them simultaneously. So we are preparing issue four. We don't know exactly how we'll call it, but the work title is maybe patriarchy or like gender. We're not exactly sure how we'll call it, but there are some texts already written, other planned currently being written for that issue. Uh, then issue five, for now we call it um, total self-management. So we want to, that's like kind of a, you know, anarchist or anti-state communists often have this question, okay, you're good at criticizing, but what do you actually want? Uh, so it's an issue that kind of provides some answer to that question. Is uh, We use this term total self-management. We think that self-management is a better term than democracy. It's kind of less, less, uh, uh, less abstract, you know. The people is an abstract category, rule is, is as well. Self-management is a bit more direct and self-explanatory. So we want to discuss various historical and current self-management projects. Uh, it is also the term self-management of Samo Uprava in Serbo-Croatian language was also the crucial term of the 19th century socialism in the Balkans. Everything was about that. So we want to kind of reaffirm this idea again. Um, and in addition to that, we are also preparing a German language kind of special edition of Antipolitica, which will be the selection of texts from the first three issues. Uh, it's already translated to German, now comrades are proofreading it, so we hope that by the end of the year uh, this will also be ready. Yeah, so some listeners absolutely should recognize your voice from the Balkan Amerikanski anti-fascist podcast, The Empire Never Ended. Uh, for those poor souls out there who haven't heard of Tenepod, can you tell us a little bit about the podcast? Yeah, so The Empire Never Ended is a podcast that I do with two anarchist friends, Fritz and Boris. We are, you know, three nerds who come from the, the, the anarchist, anti-fascist, and punk scenes. We have been friends for many, many years and often talk about some of the more bizarre things that for unknown reason interest us. Uh, it's like, you know, all the kind of bizarre fascists that exist out there. So we would often caught ourselves in having conversations about that. So at some point we decided, well, maybe I can actually we can do a podcast about that. Um, it's also unlike anti-politica, I have to say, it's not, uh, it's not in, in that sense a political or radical project because it's also a way for us to earn some money and to try to do less of uh, the horrible jobs that we are used to, like working in call centers and so on. So, yeah, I want to be clear about that. So Antipolitica is purely like a project that's, you know, as we say, political, anti-political, radical one. This one has also this kind of a job aspect to it. But of course, it's political in the sense of we approach every topic from our point of view. Um, and... Um, yeah, so uh, it's uh, currently we produce um, five episodes per week. Uh, two of them, I think, per month are free. 
Uh, sorry, yeah, five per month. <laughs> Jesus, um, what level of Patreon <laughs> do you have to be on for that? <laughs> yeah, yes, uh, no. Thankfully, yes, it's five per month. Two are free for anyone. Three are available on Patreon. Yeah, we already have more than two hundred sixty episodes, and we we kind of try to do do them in like thematic arcs. So we explore one topic in many connected episodes and these arcs are also consist of sub arcs and the arcs are ke- getting longer and longer and longer uh so we have kind of two areas that we focus on one is fascists uh often more usually american or western ones for sure and then the other focus is like balkan nationalist history so we tend to do one arc about the American fascist, then the second one about Balkan na- nationalist history, then go back to American fascist and so on. Yeah, that's kind of what the podcast is. Yeah, and then besides the the like creative elements, I mean the the podcast also has like uh, also been interacting with and documenting and promoting the documentation of uh, ongoing fascist organizers. So it's not just history, right? Um, it's not just him. Yeah. Friend of the pod, uh, 09A, for instance. Um, yes. <laughs> yes. We uh, Yes, when we started doing the podcast, we were focused in the first arc on kind of very bizarre um, uh, current uh, Nazis, also like the people who are, you know, Nazi Satanists and so on, influenced by this uh, very bizarre uh, person from Britain called David Myatt, and he's non-group group order of nine angles who also for some reason cannot stop writing to us over various social media that he has under different names and always insisting that it's not him who's writing to us although it's completely obvious that it is him um yeah so he's a very um, um i mean disgusting but also kind of very funny character we have to say who became a kind of a part of our lore uh, in some bizarre sense. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of hard to prove it if you don't have the probative evidence, right? So, exactly, yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> um, <laughs> so as an avid listener myself, if, if listeners can't tell, um, and also as mm-hmm. a Californian by, by birth, uh, I've really mm-hmm. appreciated the contributions in the latest arc on eugenics um, on the Tenepod. Mm-hmm. Uh, where I was raised, there were years of agricultural experimentation that had occurred about a hundred years before, um, by, um, by and numerous sites named after Luther Burbank, who was a famed horticulturist and also a eugenicist, uh, around the turn of the 19th and 20th centuries. Obviously it's too much to fully go into right now, but I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the basic rundown of what, you know, what the eugenics is that you've been covering, um, its application to the so-called like race sciences, as you know, quote unquote, and um, and what you've been covering in the show concerning the relationships between projects in the U.S. and say like Nazi Germany. I like again to to restate, it's easy to get into the weeds with some of these historical questions, but I think that it's really easy once you start talking about not only the ideas you can see, so to speak, like the germs of where they are now, <clears throat> but also making connections that get definitely overlooked in public education in the United States uh, trajectories of of what was happening that's now decried by a liberal order that is still underlying currents um anyway that yeah does that make sense yeah so i mean eugenics is a bit uh, diff- we did a few episodes on it we'll do a few more i think it's a horrible topic to discuss. Uh, it's also it's difficult to say what it even is. I guess they would say it is a set of beliefs and practices which aims to they would say it improving the genetic quality of the human population. What it meant actually in practice was that they were a bunch of racists who decided to give give some uh, like uh, scientific justification to the racist theories that they had. And were very successful in it because many of them were very established scientists, supported by um, institutions such, you know, as Stanford, Harvard, but all of the universities really. 
and they existed on the international level and were very well established and um, support, supported by various states and ruling classes and so on. They were, as a movement, they were established in the 19th century. To some degree, they still exist. They were extremely popular in the 1920s, 1930s. Uh, which is when they established close connections with the Nazis uh, and actually influenced uh, the Nazis very much. So the United States were seen as a kind of a leader in this area. Uh, they were the most, you, you know, um, the, the country where the eugenics movement was uh, the most established and a part of the ruling establishment and the, the scientific academic one as well. Uh, and the Germans, even before the, the Nazis came to power, were looking at, you know, United States as a role model. California especially was uh, a, a big part of that. All of the eugenicists saw themselves as, you know, partially scientists and academics, but also activists who wanted to influence legislation. So in practice, what they wanted to do is force, like, um, you know, sterilize people by force, certain populations that they saw as unfit to reproduce and even it, they also had like exterminationist idea they wanted also to kill people they also influenced legislation in america there were like uh, laws in california and maybe other parts as well that were re a reflection of these uh, ideas and um, theories and beliefs and this is especially something that uh, impressed the nazis uh, they wanted to reproduce such things there. So the 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 Nazi, the German eugenicists called themselves racial hygienists. That's the term they used, and they had very close connections with the the U.S. ones. Um, uh, eugenicists in America would later whitewash their own history after the Second World War because it became less popular to say that you're into race theory and such things after you know the the Holocaust and the Second World War. But uh, the way they whitewashed their history was they, they made this false dichotomy between the real scientific eugenicists and the pseudo-scientific ones. And they said the pseudo-scientific ones were the Nazis and the legitimate scientists were not. And in fact, such division doesn't make a lot of sense because... Many of the very well academically established eugenicists were also big, big fans of German Nazis and supporters of that system, had close ties with, you know, people there. They they wrote books that influenced Hitler, who he mentions them in Mein Kampf and so on. So that was a way to kind of whitewash the movement. And there is like a lot of continuity, you know, they never really, these people never went away. They changed uh, the language they used, maybe some of the more kind of explicitly Nazi ones stopped being the leaders of scientific associations and then the, the ones who called themselves reformists, who were also fans of Nazis, but said that maybe the Nazis overdid some things or something like that. Uh, really became the more prominent ones in, in positions of power after the Second World War. But all of them also helped reintegrate, you know, Nazi scientists into the international movement after the Second World War, including the guy who was like um, the, men the professor who was the mentor to Mengele, for example. And Mengele was sending like... Um, specimens like human eyes to his professor for i don't know what reasons but that guy was later on integrated into academic life and institutions by these american academics you know after the second world war and was publishing texts in in u.s academic journals and so on and also repeating this idea how we need to get rid of all of these nazi pseudoscientists is the guy who got you know human eyes from angular so it was a very well established, very influential, very powerful movement of American elites and American academic university elites and political ones as well uh, that had a close connection with Nazis and actually influenced Nazis. Yeah, and I think that that point about like the um, the changing of the language, the the removal, the whitewashing, the removal of like the people that are saying the quiet part out loud from establishments of uh, 
policy or academic power in the U.S. is like pretty clear when you think about when you listen closely to people that are talking about public like social support networks existing through the government of, you know, what what is it promoting? Who is it promoting uh, in terms of if we uh, have social housing, if we have like subsidized medical, you know, in the United States, like the the cutting back of these while they may be like actively genocidal in their outcomes are less exterminationalist in their in their mm -hmm. terminology. And an important thing that I think that your project does for the podcast is that you make more explicit, you draw the lines, you name the names of people that are of those tendencies and the lineage up to today. So when you talk about the bell or when Fritz mentions the bell curve, yeah, you know, you can see this tendency, you know, or American Renaissance and the discussions that are happening in that space. Um, yeah. So I really appreciate it personally. And I think you guys are funny as also, but. Well, thank you. Yeah. We try. Yeah. My parasocial uh, it, relationship is just like flourishing. <laughs> Yeah, we try to have humor there as well. I mean, also, I think it's spontaneous, but um, I think it helps when you talk the, about these very bleak uh, subjects, but also to approach it in a way that's not like... Um, I think we are... I think we are... I, I think at least that we are successful in uh, making the point how all of these people are evil and dangerous at the same time as laughing at them for how ridiculous they are. Yeah, and it does a job um, uh, that some other yeah. podcasts that I listen to sometimes, like where they'll focus on something that's terrible in the world and just be like, that's pretty bad, huh? You know, or like sort of like yeah. laugh in that line in a hipstery manner that almost it seems like is working to diminish the cruelty or the terror of what is being talked about. Whereas I think yes. your project does a very good job of Avoiding that, not making the terribleness the joke, making the terrible people the joke in how ridiculous exactly. their approach is. Uh, I mean, that's one trap, what you ju just described. And then there is the opposite one of like liberal journalists who are kind of doing the, the job of fascists for them uh, by scaring people uh, with fascists, which is what fascists want. They want to scare people. So, you know, you, you often have like these fascist groups that list all of the like media, mainstream media on them mm -hmm. that there exist that we are very uh, proud of, you know, uh, because they, you know, they seem very scary in it and nothing else except scary. And, they, and, and you know, we discussed earlier what fascism is and I, th I think that the kind of the main point of them is to scare people, to terrorize them, to, yeah, pacify them. So I think a lot of these kind of perspectives that comes from liberal media are doing the the job of fascists for them in in a way. Yeah, and that's an interesting because that's um that's a step beyond like the critique that's been in the last decade has been about platforming fascists yeah. normalizing like look Richard Spencer is a dapper blah 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 who eats macaroni everybody eats macaroni <laughs> yeah. Yeah. like cool <laughs> yeah yeah well um let me see uh, last question that I really got is uh have y'all considered um making a book or some sort of like printed thing that synthesizes. I know you, you're doing a lot of reading. Like I, I, uh, really can hear the pain in your voice when talking about reading Imperium mm -hmm. and so, mm -hmm. or so much Ezra pound, but like, yeah, not to draw people away from subscribing to the podcast, but have you thought about any like print projects related to this that synthesize some of these things? We did, yes. We thought about that immediately when we started doing this. Didn't really do anything about it. Uh, there's a lot of things that we do, but it, it is something that we occasionally think about. There is an anarchist publisher out there who's sometimes putting some pressure on us to to do something like that. So maybe, maybe uh, it is something that we occasionally think about. A coloring book, if nothing else, just... Yes. All the freaks. Here we go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> cool. So how can people um, listen to, subscribe, and support The Empire Never Ended? I mean, it's uh, it's on Patreon, uh, patreon.com slash Tanepod, but it's also on a bunch of other places where you can listen to podcasts, of course. Cool. Well, um, Ray, is there anything that you wanted to mention that I didn't ask about? No, I think that's that's about it. Cool. Thanks a lot for having the conversation and for the projects that you're involved in. I think they're pretty awesome. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for this great conversation. Thanks.
And now some words from anarchist prisoner Sean Swain. Many people I care deeply about are in non-monogamous but committed relationships. That is, they care deeply for their partners and intend to maintain their relationships for the long term, but on a non-monogamous basis. I think this is important for people to attempt. I believe much of the social norms we have come to accept through the course of our lives are social constructs. The idea of race is a social construct, as is gender. Where does this idea come from that humans as a species are monogamous, that we have one sexual partner at a time? That an intimate relationship is always only between two people? If we're going to reconstruct social life, we have to question everything, smash the idols of a bygone order that has been imposed on us, and deconstruct the restrictive norms we have sometimes thoughtlessly accepted. And all of that notwithstanding, I am extremely skeptical of non-monogamous relationships working. Not others' relationships, just any that would involve me. I'm just being honest here. I consider myself to be moderately self-aware. I think I have a decent sense of my own strengths and weaknesses. Whatever the circumstances, I don't see myself maintaining relationships with multiple partners that would last longer than 15 minutes. Wouldn't make it through an entire episode of your favorite sitcom. There are a million reasons, and none of them have anything to do with the sex part of it. You have to figure, in the course of daily life, genital friction doesn't take up a lot of time. It's everything else. I'm very stingy with my time, for example. I like having time to myself. When I'm in a relationship, I make a conscious point to commit time to that relationship. I invest time. But I don't know how much time I'm willing to invest in multiple partners. That seems like too much time space to me. I don't mind asking my partner, how was your day? And I'll even listen to the answer, almost all the time. But if I had two partners, I would have to ask that question twice every day and listen to the answers. I wouldn't make it. There's no way I'd be fully engaged to the entirety of both answers. I just don't have it in me. I'd start pondering something, my mind would wander, and then I'd get caught. I'm a terrible liar, you know. I've never been any good at it. When my eyes glaze over and my mouth falls slightly ajar, and the other person asks, Are you listening to me? I always answer with, Huh? Yeah. Huh. That's the response of an idiot not paying attention. And what if I didn't just have to listen to two partners' accounts of their days, but maybe even had to listen to my partner's other partners ramble on about their stupid days? I don't even care about their days. I bet one of them is just a little bit too bougie and maybe melodramatic. And if I had to hazard a guess, my money is that the other one being the culprit it scarfs down all the leftover pizza in the middle of the night when I'm sound asleep. I'm just saying, I don't want to sound petty over some slices of pizza, but this is the same one who makes the big show out of picking off the toppings they don't like. You know what I'm saying. This jerk is going to pick the toppings off a perfectly good pizza and eat up what I intended to have for lunch tomorrow, and I've got to listen to their day? This bozo isn't even involved in my experiences of genital friction. Not that everything revolves around sex. It doesn't it? Sort of? The person with whom I'm sharing special intimate moments, I'm willing to take a lot more of their nonsense because I know they take a lot of my nonsense, even though my nonsense is somewhat charming and endearing. And after all, there is genital friction as a great stress reliever when it's all said and done. Just saying. But a partner of a partner doesn't contribute to my experience of genital friction, and in fact, might be an obstruction to it on occasion. And i got to listen to how their day went? It's not even the slightest bit interesting. As far as I'm concerned, they can share that sniveling with the bougie melodrama while they pick the toppings off that pizza I bought. Also, I'm particular about my sleep environment. I like it dark. Like, dark, dark. And I like a fan blowing. And I like it cold, just a bit chilly, but with a heavy blanket. I need to find someone who can accept all that. 
the odds of finding two other partners who would both accept all of those conditions are really slim. Not to mention my toenails. I rarely cut them. It's not a thing. I'm just lazy. And socks aren't really that expensive. So my toenails are like weapons. They're pretty solid, too, and sharp. When they get long enough, they kind of curl under like Fritos. My toenails have ended more than one relationship. My former ex had scrapes on her shins, looked like she was wrestling a weed whacker. And just in a broader context here, I've just always been a committed monogamist. I've always been fully committed to that one other person, and I've messed up every single relationship I've ever had. Imagine me dividing that effort between two people and having to be civil to my partner's partners. Oh, hell no. That's a train wreck. It's just too much. I think I'd rather try to juggle Ginsu knives than multiple relationships. I can't dare to imagine that I will ever find more than one person at a time willing to tolerate these toenails, but that's just me. I wish the rest of you all the best of luck. This is Anarchist Prisoner Sean Swain from the Super Duper Uber Mega Ultra Hyper Turbo Multi Maxi Max in Youngstown, Ohio. If you're successfully maintaining multiple partners to accept your toenails, you are the resistance. You can still write Sean at his new old new again address at Sean Swain number A243205 OSP Youngstown 878 Coitsville Hubbard Road Youngstown, Ohio 44505. You can find his past writings, updates on his case, hear his past audio, find out how to get his books, plus ways to contribute to his legal defense fund at seanswain.org. This is the Final Straw Radio. The show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. If you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. If you care to, you can send us letters at TFSR, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. Programming support is brought to you by Firestorm Books. Located at 1022 Haywood Road in West Asheville, Firestorm is a bookstore and social movement space owned by its workers in operation since 2008. Their event calendar and complete catalog of books can be found online at firestorm.coop.